Welcome back to another Disney vs. Disney. I finally thought of a name. It's not that good, but it'll do. In this episode, I've decided to compare two of my favorite classic Disney films, Pinocchio and Peter Pan. Now, at first glance, these two movies don't seem to be the types of movies that should be compared side by side, but I promise you that in the end, you'll see more similarities than you first thought. Maybe you already see those similarities, but that's beside the point. I'm generally going to stick with the same criteria from the last video, including best opening, best villain, best songs, best supporting cast, best morals, and best ending. However, this time, I'm going to have eight categories, potentially allowing this to end in a tie, because I will have a category for our male lead, as well as a special supporting character section for two of the most iconic Disney characters, aside from Mickey Mouse and his friends, Tinkerbell and Jiminy Cricket. Now, as promised, I'm going to show you the Rotten Tomatoes ratings before I get started. As you can see, the users like Peter Pan a little better with an 80% approval rating, while Pinocchio is lagging behind just a little bit at 72%. But the critic score is what seems to have Pinocchio blow Peter Pan out of the water. Peter Pan may have a solid 75% approval rating from its critics, but Pinocchio has a perfect score of 100% approval rating from critics. 100%! And from critics. Well, I'm a diehard Disney fan myself and love the high-flying adventures of Peter Pan, like many fans do, but I am analyzing from a critical perspective. So, will I go the critic route and say Pinocchio? Well, there's only one way to find out. So both of these movies contain some of the most beloved and some of the most memorable openings of any Disney movie. How do they open? Literally with a song and some opening credits. Now, if I were to tell that to someone about just any movie, they would claim that it's a boring way to open a movie, right? Wrong. In fact, I admire both of these movies because the simplicity of the credits rolling still creates this feeling of joy and anticipation that can be felt when the openings are heard. You see the images of the studio name with the music that you hear, and you just know what movie it is right off the bat, and it's just magical for what a simple opening can do. It gives more credit to the songs than of the openings, though, so let's dive a little deeper into what we could call the openings of the movies. Following the credits of Pinocchio, it's revealed to us that a little bug is resting on a book singing the song that we just heard. His name? Jiminy Cricket, of course. We're introduced to the jacket and hat-wearing Cricket, who, interestingly enough, we learn, wasn't always the way he was. We are then shown a Jiminy who has more tattered clothes and is just looking for a place to sleep. It's actually an interesting take on the way that bugs inhabit the homes of people, like vagabonds. Anyway, he leads us to the house of a kind toy maker named Geppetto, who lives with his cat Figaro and his fish Cleo. We see Geppetto playfully play around with his new and most beloved toy, a wooden marionette named Pinocchio. He plays around with his toy, and toys with, no pun intended, his cat and fish as he dances cheerily around. However, the most important and one of the most iconic scenes in any Disney movie is when Geppetto wishes upon his wishing star, wishing that Pinocchio would become a real boy. Simple, beloved, and iconic. However, Peter Pan opens in a similar way. A narrator begins to tell the audience of the Darling family with little contrast in how the Darling parents' attitudes are regarding Peter Pan, while the parents themselves talk about a party that they must prepare for, showing more of their character than just what's said about them by the narrator. The children are then introduced. First, John and Michael, the two sons of the Darlings who love the adventures of Peter Pan, their nursemaid, a dog named Nana, and finally, the eldest child of the family, Wendy Darling, the firm believer in Peter Pan and the source of the stories that are being told about him. However, the real kicker in this extended opening to the story is that Wendy is told by her no-nonsense father that her days in the nursery are finished and that she needs to learn to grow up. Now, both of these opening scenes are very similar because they show us the supporting cast without introducing the title character. It keeps the audience in a state of anticipation, although Peter Pan has a little bit of an edge because they don't even show the character at all before he's meant to appear. What they also both share is the structure of the lives that the characters live in. The Darlings are a generally kind-hearted, adventure-loving family tied down by the man of the house who just happens to be the only strict one. Geppetto, an old toy maker seemingly content with his life, is living with his fish and cat. Each of these scenes has a balance of comedy and drama, with the comical animals doing what the Disney animals do, each of them trying to mind their own business, but unavoidably causing some trouble and providing some good entertainment and humor. Peter Pan's dramatic moment is when Mr. Darling declares that Wendy will no longer sleep in the nursery, while Pinocchio's is when Geppetto wishes on a star, hoping that Pinocchio can become a real boy. Now, one thing I will give Pinocchio is that the scene where Geppetto wishes upon the star is clearly a better and more iconic scene that really captures what it's trying to get across. It shows the hopefulness of a kind old man and the disinterest of his cat and fish, and really gets the theme of wishing upon a star to make a dream come true across. On the other hand, however, Peter Pan's a much more ambiguous movie. 
Peter Pan isn't shown, and it gives more of a family dilemma, as well as the main dilemma in the film. Nana has much more funny moments than Figaro and Cleo, in my opinion, and the urgency of the situation and the dramatics of the outburst before the children go to bed are much more interesting than an old man wishing upon a star. I will admit, though, that the general ideas are a little better in Pinocchio. Let's compare. I just want a child, as opposed to, I'm sending you to another room in the house. I mean, I know the concept behind Mr. Darling saying that is to grow up. And that's why I think, despite the more iconic wishing upon a star, I think I'm going to lean more toward the second star to the right. Point goes to Peter Pan. I'll get you for this, Pan, if it's the last thing I do. Now we come to one of the best parts, the villains. Many of you would probably think that it's a no-brainer as to who the better villain is. But is it, though? In my mind, it's a matter of icon versus substance. Let me explain. I originally thought that Captain Hook was going to take this category easily. However, as I look back, is he really a great villain? I mean, granted, he gives Peter a run for his money quite a lot, and does actually try to kill him, which many villains don't want to kill the hero, but it always seems like Peter's able to defeat him with such ease. Even with a band of pirates by his side, he always seems to come up short. I mean, he does make Peter Pan start to question himself toward the end when he challenges to, to a fight without flying and claiming he's a coward. Although, even that part's kind of hypocritical, because Captain Hook himself doesn't live to the fact that he was disgraced when Peter Pan fed his hand to the crocodile. He is quite tricky in the way that he lures Tinkerbell to him and tricks her into finding Peter Pan's hideout, but on the other hand, he and his band of pirates couldn't have just patrolled the island until they found him? And also, that promise he makes that makes him seem so noble when he doesn't lay a finger or hook on Peter Pan, but instead tries to blow him up, to me it seems more cowardice than anything, really. I guess I just saw him as an embodiment of evil to contrast Peter Pan's good qualities so that there'd be a pure good versus evil mindset of the movie. And to be fair, it does work, but I guess I never saw him as a strong villain on his own, a more comedic one in the way he banders with Mr. Smee, his first mate, and one to be taken as a joke, similar to the way that Peter Pan views about, about him. Now, the villains in Pinocchio, on the other hand, I admit, do seem a bit shallow at first. However, there's a clear purpose to all of them being where they are when they are. The villains in Pinocchio are Honest John and Gideon, Stromboli, and the Coachman. I think that the characters that are developed the most are definitely Honest John and Gideon, but the interesting thing about them is that they really have no true motive against Pinocchio. They're just selfish people who want to exploit Pinocchio's innocence in order to gain money and fame. In fact, they're not only interesting, but realistic too. Pinocchio has some of the best villains in that they're representing an actual person in real life. No one in real life just wants to be evil to be evil, and I'm not saying that every Disney movie should have a realistic villain, because we need villains like Captain Hook as well. And one upside to Captain Hook is that he's meant to represent Mr. Darling and how cruel he's being. That part of Captain Hook is a great aspect of him, but neither Mr. Darling or Captain Hook have any realization or character change because of the other. Pinocchio creates realistic villains in such a unique way, and yet still innocent way. You have Honest John and Gideon who lead Pinocchio away despite his conscience telling him otherwise. As soon as they disappear from the audience, you have Stromboli, who it seems like is a fine and successful man who makes Pinocchio famous. It appears that trusting strangers paid off at first, until Stromboli turns out to be a bitter person who wants to do what he can to get money out of Pinocchio. Even though the coachman isn't a developed character, even he represents that silent stranger that everyone thinks it's okay to go along with. Pinocchio encounters Honest John and Gideon, who he's reluctant to go along with, but is not forceful enough to deny, so he's whisked away again, only to cause more trouble for himself. The coachman almost plays the role of Captain Hook, as he's the pure essence of evil in the movie, balancing out those greedy villains. The villains themselves almost drive the story of Pinocchio because of their actions, and where they lead Pinocchio. Maybe not as memorable, but certainly charismatic, certainly meaningful. Point goes to Pinocchio. <laughs> Now we have the supporting cast. This one's a little difficult because Peter Pan has much more support with the exception of Tinkerbell because we're saving her for the later category. However, Pinocchio's lack of support actually helps his villains and helps the story progress like I said before. But for the sake of analysis, let's consider all the side characters. In Peter Pan, you have Wendy, John, and Michael, the three children that Peter takes to Neverland with him, as well as the Lost Boys, who are Peter's followers, essentially. In Pinocchio, you have Pinocchio's father, Geppetto, as well as his pets, Figaro and Cleo. Now, in Pinocchio, Geppetto is not in it as much at all until the ending. 
In the beginning, he sets up the tone of the story. We see him once looking for Pinocchio, and then he serves as a motivation for Pinocchio toward the end. In terms of support, there isn't much that's able to be given by him until the ending, and Figaro and Cleo are there for comic relief, and mind you, they do their jobs, but there isn't much of them seen. It's sort of like Nana in Peter Pan. Speaking of which, let's look at Peter Pan. You have Wendy, who serves as sort of the love interest for Peter Pan and the firm believer in him. John is the smart one who's very intellectual and yet uses that strength in order to find adventure in everyday life. Michael's the innocent one that's dressed in a onesie and carries a teddy bear, the cute one. They serve as Peter Pan's guest to his magical land and the children that he can influence in the way that he sees fit. The Lost Boys are also interesting because they're just the friends of Peter and the group that he leads, but they also serve as part of his character. He feels troubled in the end when Wendy seems to realize that the children must grow up and everyone seems to turn against him. Being a boy and relying on friendships, you can see that he's conflicted with the burden he bears in keeping up his ideals without any support from anyone else. All the characters really teach him something along the way, and he also teaches them something as well. The only one of Pinocchio who serves as someone who could support him, with the exception of himself and his conscience, is the Blue Fairy, who only appears twice to tell him very simply what he must do. And she does her job, but it's not really as meaningful, albeit more memorable, as in the scene that Pinocchio's nose grows, but the characters in Peter Pan do more for the character, and they have interesting interests and motivations, and are more developed. So, point goes to Peter Pan. I'll get you for this, Pan, if it's the last thing I do! Next, we examine the songs. Now, with the exception of the opening songs, Pinocchio and Peter Pan aren't really known for their songs. They aren't as popular as songs from Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Aladdin, The Little Mermaid, but we can still analyze them. Now, there's five major songs of Pinocchio worth talking about, excluding their reprises, and six songs in Peter Pan. Now, I already discussed the openings. The Second Star to the Right and When You Wish Upon a Star are both great songs that appropriately set their tone to their respective movies. Obviously, Pinocchio is much more popular and much more memorable. But we then get to the next two major songs, My Little Wooden Head and You Can Fly. My Little Wooden Head is a cheery little number that shows Geppetto playing with Pinocchio and sort of introduces the characters to the audience. Peter Pan's You Can Fly, I feel, is more effective and more memorable because it not only shows the children heading to Neverland, but it explores and gives fantastic shots of the city of London. When You Wish Upon a Star and You Can Fly are basically the songs that embody the entirety of the movies, because they're the songs that you can possibly pit together the most. They both open and close their movies and are just so popular and magical because of how highly regarded they are right next to their movie. Pinocchio's next two major songs are Give a Little Whistle and I've Got No Strings. Give a Little Whistle is also a peppy little song that isn't one of the more important ones or the more memorable ones, but it does its job in explaining what a conscience is and introduces the idea of it to Pinocchio. I've Got No Strings is a much more iconic song, and it has so many unique components to it, such as when Stromboli has the different puppets from around the world join Pinocchio. In Peter Pan, you have the ever-so-famous Following the Leader that has become such a trademark song in its own right that it sometimes isn't even associated with Peter Pan. And you also have What Makes the Red Man Red, the song that the Indians sing after Peter saves Tiger Lily. Now, because of the fact that following the leader is sometimes regarded on its own and not associated with Peter Pan, I think that Pinocchio has stronger songs here as well. Give a Little Whistle is one of those innocent Disney songs that first introduced how Disney songs would go. If there was something important going on, and if it was warranted, a song would be sung. We didn't see too much of that in Snow White, as there aren't many songs in the first place, but Give a Little Whistle was a simple song that displayed an important me message and issue, listening to your conscience, and it's something that I personally still hear in my head and always try to follow the best I can. I've Got No Strings is probably the more important song, and it's just so colorful and funny as you see an innocent kid singing in his theatrical debut only to fall flat in his face. Everyone's worst nightmare. It's such a good song, and not only does it incorporate different styles of music and different cultural puppets, but it's the perfect song in the perfect context, a theatrical puppet show, to show how successful things may seem to be, and leave on a high note, only to find that in the end, all that glitz and glamour is not all it's cracked up to be. Now, as I said before, following the leader is so popular now that everybody knows it, but I feel that a connection to Peter Pan is somewhat lost. Especially because there's little purpose as to why it's sung. I mean, yeah, it's cute and funny when Michael is left behind and interacts unknowingly with all the animals he has to jump and climb on, but is it one of those songs that really is necessary? To me, it's really not. What Makes the Red Man Red is a song sung by the Indians who celebrate with the Lost Boys, I said this as I said before, upon Peter's return from saving the Indian chief's daughter. 
Now, the song is catchy and interesting, and it has its great moments, like when Wendy realizes that John and Michael are becoming like animals and Peter Pan is flirting with Tiger Lily. However, not only is it not as memorable of a song, but I feel that all the good purposes that it serves are carried over into the next more meaningful song, Your Mother and Mine, in which Wendy sings about how wonderful a mother is. And you can see it starts to really get to Peter as well as the Lost Boys, albeit in different ways. But I don't know, even though the song Wendy sings is meaningful, I feel like, though the Pinocchio songs are equally as meaningful and twice as much as memorable. However, we get to our last two songs, where they're the songs that the villains sing, The Elegant Captain Hook and High Diddly D. Now, you already know how I feel about the villains of Pinocchio. They embody real people, but also capture and present this Disney-like aura around them. With that being said, High Diddly D is one of those songs that is so mesmerizing and cheerful and just makes you want to dance, but yet we know it's leading Pinocchio down the wrong path. With that being said, I love The Elegant Captain Hook. It's equally as peppy, and it's one of my favorite songs in the movie. It shows how Captain Hook wants to trick the children, or bribe them, or actually more like force them, to become a part of his crew. It's not one of the more necessary songs, but I kind of like it. That being said, not many people know Captain Hook's song like they know Ursula's or Gaston's or Judge Frollo's, and in the end, I feel like Pinocchio has stronger songs than Peter Pan, and even if they're not stronger, like the case of the main two songs, which are kind of hard to judge because they're at least equal. So for this section, though, Pinocchio is the overall winner. Point goes to Pinocchio. Pinocchio! P-I-N-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-O-P-I-N-O-
Peter Pan's theme is also universal, though, especially in the end when Mr. Darling realizes that he has seen a familiar ship before and there's a childish twinkle in his eye when Rend Wendy realizes that she has to grow up but still maintains the kindness and innocence that she had as a child. So which is better? Like I said, I think the idea of re remaining young at heart is very important. However, by a small amount, I feel that not only does Pinocchio's theme flow better, but people can still look back on it and, I and find multiple themes that still apply to them and not just the children. A tough one, but I think I'm going to go with Pinocchio on this one. Point goes to Pinocchio. Pinocchio! P-I-N-N-U-O! It's a wrap. Now, before we go on to look at our main characters, I want to look at two of the most iconic characters in Disney history, Jiminy Cricket and Tinkerbell. Now, both of these characters are important to their respective stories. Jiminy Cricket is Pinocchio's conscience, who tries to teach him the difference between right and wrong, and Tinkerbell is Peter Pan's best friend, who always accompanies him on his adventures and gives him the power to fly. Jiminy Cricket starts out as a vagabond-ish character that's merely an observer of the world around him. However, once he becomes involved with Pinocchio, he sticks by him no matter what. Now, Jiminy isn't perfect, but he's far from a typical character. He serves as Pinocchio's conscience, which is a unique role to have. He sticks by Pinocchio, but once Pinocchio makes his choices, there's little that a little cricket can do except scream and shout out advice. In a way, sort of what a conscience does. However, despite being a part of Pinocchio himself, he's still his own character. He himself knows right and wrong and represents that friend that will always stick by you and support you no matter what. He's also quite comical, working in innocent humor when appropriate and generating lots of laughs. Tinkerbell, on the other hand, is very independent and an opinionated character. She's very matter-of-fact about things and is very sassy and is, she's a strong female character. Her major characteristic, that's one of the subplots of the film, is her jealousy of Wendy's relationship with Peter Pan. Tinkerbell is so fascinating in the way that she only speaks in jingles and yet, like the carpet in Aladdin, is still very expressive. The major issue I have with Tinkerbell, though, is that she's not the film for a good amount of time. She doesn't stick by Peter's side after she tries to have Wendy killed, and then leads Captain Hook to Peter's hideout. And even though those are such malicious, malicious acts for someone who's apparently Peter's best friend, they don't really go anywhere. I mean, granted, she nearly pays the ultimate sacrifice toward the end, but her story's a brief one. Tries to kill Wendy, banished, captured, tricked, and captured again, escapes, nearly pays with her life. Although, it's not in the film for a good amount of time, but it sounds like the foundation for such a great story. But because there are more important matters to deal with, her story is so brief. However, as brief as it is, she is one of the most compelling characters throughout the story. So who is better? Well, Tinkerbell doesn't really support Peter until the end when she saves his life, but is never brought up in her own right after that. However, the character itself is so intriguing in how she goes from trying to kill someone to saving someone. But in the same right, Jiminy Cricket does absolutely all he can, despite being physically unable to help Pinocchio, but more so to be his guide. He sticks with him, develops as Pinocchio does. Tinkerbell, I would have loved to see a spin-off made about- God, no, no, God, not that spin-off. Yuck. I mean, I would have loved to see Tinkerbell's story and Peter Pan be seen in a movie, sort of like The Lion King one and a half. It would have been so interesting to see, and I would have loved to see how she manages to cope with her ideas and the way she feels, the way she does. Not sugarcoat everything and change her personality completely to be the definitive, stereotypical embodiment of good versus evil and... Uh, anyway. I mean, the return in Neverland had more development for Tink as opposed to this new crap. Then again, I don't want to get off track, but I think that for the movies I'm examining... Jiminy Cricket's the better supporting character. I love Tinkerbell, and I think that she's the more interesting character to watch in Peter Pan than in anything else she's in, but for what they're each worth, I prefer Jiminy. Point goes to Jiminy Cricket and Pinocchio. Pinocchio! P-I-N-N-U-O! P-I-N-N-U-O! a wrap. Now we come to the main men. Er, boys. Er, not quite boys. Whatever. Peter Pan and Pinocchio. Two of the most famous Disney characters and two of my favorites. So what's so special about them? Well, first and foremost, their childish and yet strong characteristics and personality traits makes them perfect Disney characters and perfect characters that people of all ages can enjoy watching. Why? Because they're innocent, they're curious, they're adventurous, and they make decisions that lead us to the main action and cause us to want to watch more. But what's so interesting about their stories? Well, Pinocchio is a wooden puppet brought to life by magic and he needs to prove himself brave, truthful, and unselfish in order to become a real boy. He already has a big responsibility to make his father's wish completely come true and starts off on a seemingly harmless journey to school. When he encounters Honest John and Gideon, he... 
I feel like I've talked about this already. Pinocchio is basically an innocent child embarking on a journey and learning from right and wrong. But in the most extreme of ways, he tries to do what's right and yet always manages to mess up. However, he's determined to prove himself to the Blue Fairy and to Geppetto, and that's what makes him who he is. He's enjoyable to watch because he's interesting, and he's interesting to watch this cute little boy land himself in so much trouble. Peter Pan, on the other hand, takes it upon himself to take three children to his home in Neverland and show them adventure. However, he has a clear motivation for doing such a thing, because if he doesn't act now, then Wendy's stories about him will not be told again. The little vain, because the stories are about him, but hey, he's a typical kid. What kid wouldn't want to hear an adventure story about them? However, Peter's adventures are true. When he takes them to Neverland, he starts out as a bit of a cocky hero, but a hero nonetheless. He shows everyone around and feels on top of the world in the way that he's showing everyone around the great parts and showing them the great parts about being a kid. However, he begins to feel betrayed when Wendy starts talking about how even though it's fun to be a kid, there needs to be structure, and with that comes a mother. There is now a conflict within him as he stays behind and lets all his friends leave because they all want a mother. However, one of my favorite scenes that really represents the all-around character of Peter, as well as his overall story, is when, ironically, Tink saves his life. Even after he banishes Tinkerbell and rekindles his relationship with her, it almost seems hopeless. He realizes that she's still his pal, and I know I disregarded Tink earlier, but I think it's a more of a testament to the title character, how he feels betrayed and alone, and yet the person he fought with in order to go on adventures with his guests is still there for him, and he still learns something in the process. We even see him at the end as a swashbuckling hero, and even a kind-hearted captain as he accepts the fact that the children need to go home. In my mind, Peter Pan is a more compelling character, and although Pinocchio is just as great of a character, I think a lot of what's good about him comes from the morals and themes of the story, which Pinocchio already won. So I think for this section, the point goes to Peter Pan. I'll get you for this, Pan, if it's the last thing I do! So now, with a tighter race than last time, we come to the endings of our stories. Pinocchio's ending appears to be a sad one, as Pinocchio gave his life for his family and his poor father is left grieving at the bedside, along with Figaro, Cleo, and Jiminy Cricket. However, Pinocchio has proven himself brave, truthful, and unselfish, and deserves to become a real boy. The Blue Fairy transforms Pinocchio into a real boy, and Geppetto and the others celebrate with comical and joyful celebration. However, the true heartwarming thanks that Jiminy says to the Blue Fairy, upon which she gives him his long-awaited badge that declares him an official conscience. With a stare into the sky and the reprise of When You Wish Upon a Star, it's a simple ending that carries a strong meaning. Peter Pan is also similar in the way that it ends, quite simply. The Darlings come home to see that Wendy is sleeping by the window. She tells him about the adventures that she had. However, even more than that, Wendy tells her father that he was right and that she is ready to grow up. The root of the entire movie leads to such a mature ending of realization by Wendy, but that's not all. Mr. Darling looks out the window and sees a ship flying through the clouds. Upon seeing this, he smiles and claims that he believes that he's seen the ship before when he was a boy. However, because of the simplicity of these endings, I think Pinocchio is so joyous when Pinocchio becomes a real boy. However, the ending of Peter Pan shows how it isn't just Wendy who is affected by Peter Pan, it's Mr. Darling as well. I love the endings of both movies, but on account of the fact that the morals and themes of Pinocchio are so strong throughout that the very ending is still effective, but not in the same way that Peter Pan does. Peter Pan concludes with a firm message of being young at heart, while Pinocchio finishes with the song When You Wish Upon a Star. Still effective and moving, but if I had to extremely nitpick in order to choose, point goes to Peter Pan. I'll get you for this, Pan, if it's the last thing I do! So, what do you know? It's a tie! With their strong leads, sidekicks, villains, morals, and story, Pinocchio and Peter Pan prove to be tough movies to judge, and even tougher to choose as a winner. They both display the messages that they want to get across in their own way with their own unique stories and characters. These two beloved classics are two of my favorites, and I guess it just depends on what I'm in the mood for in terms of which movie I'll decide to watch. Well, as I said for the other video I made, both are unique movies that are pure Disney classics and will always be remembered and beloved by all. See you guys in my next video, Snow White vs. Sleeping Beauty.